Our featured presenter is Lowell Putnam. Uh, and I am very pleased. Um, Lowell, Lowell is actually filling in for someone else um, who could not join. But I'm very pleased with, with the result I have. Um, a great bio for, for, for Lowell. And he's going to describe a general overview of the Lowell Observatory, history, current state, and a set of images taken uh, through their considerable size uh, Lowell Discovery Telescope, which, which I, I know there's like public observing at this observatory. So I'm, I, am, I am anxious to hear. So I will stop sharing and Lowell, I will, I will let you take over. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure to see everybody here. You, I forgive the darkness. I've been exiled to a different room in our house without a lot of good lighting. Um, so I'm pretending I'm from a galaxy far, far away. And all of a sudden, I've got no... Hello. There. Now it will let me screen share all of a sudden. All righty. So, there we are. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I have only got a single monitor up here, so if there are questions, um, I suspect chat and then Joe can interrupt me is probably the best way to handle it. Uh, before I get going into the presentation, I do want to be clear, I am not a scientist. Uh, I have a psychology degree, which doesn't qualify me for very much at all. And um, I my background professionally is as a software developer and systems design uh, expert. And uh, in later years, I became some level of business expertise because I started my own business and had all the joys that went in with that. So um, what I'm going to do here is talk a little bit about Lowell Observatory. Uh, the unique governance that makes Lowell uh, very unique, the sole trusteeship. Uh, a little bit about our current science facilities and the research, uh, kinds of research that we do. Uh, a brief uh, side trip into uh, Pluto. Uh, you'll see why. And then um, some uh, new research that we do. Uh, just one particular example. Um, and then... Uh, engaging the public, which is another core part of our mission, uh, is uh, public engagement uh, beyond just scientific research. And then, as promised, some images from our 4.3 meter uh, Lowell Discovery Telescope. So, uh, we were founded in 1894 by Percival Lowell, uh, Boston native, uh, Harvard graduate, as, as stated. He was um, the eldest son of uh, very much a, a Yankee wasp family, uh, very well-to-do, uh, traveled around the world, particularly to Japan and Korea, uh, where he wrote a number of books, which became uh, New York Times bestsellers, uh, and uh, was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1892 as a result of his uh, literary work from Japan and Korea. He was always in love with uh, astronomy and the stars. His longest uh, memory in his life is of his mother waking him up in uh, about age three and taking him up to the roof of their house to see the comet Donati going across the sky. And, and that stuck with him uh, all his life. So he, in 1893, coming back from, from the Orient, he decided uh, that he would pick up the work of uh, Schiaparelli in um, examining Mars, and he would build his own observatory as a way of doing that. So this was the first observatory that was picked, a uh, modern observatory, it was picked for its seeing. It wasn't picked for a convenient location to where the scientists live, um, but rather where the best uh, viewing could be done. Um, obviously, Percival is very famous for his promotion of the theories of canals and life on Mars. Uh, but he also uh, started the first search uh, after running the calculations for the probable location of what was called Planet X. We now know it as Pluto. Uh, he 
popularized astronomy and science. He was kind of the Carl Sagan of his day. And um, so, and if you read first editions of E.R. Burroughs, Edgar Rice Burroughs, or H.G. Wells, they talk about the influence Percival Lowell and, and his talk about Mars had on their approach to science fiction. And perhaps most importantly, he established the trust for Lowell Observatory for carrying on the study of astronomy uh, with an emphasis on the solar system. And, and so we are here today. Uh, along the way, a few things did happen. Um, in 1912, uh, V.M. Slipher, who worked uh, at the observatory, uh, was uh, looking at these things called spiral nebulae. And Percival had brought him, bought for him a spectrograph to use to do this. And he published his results to a standing ovation at the uh, American Astronomical Society meeting, showing that these, um, these, these objects were, as he described it, fleeing uh, the, from, away from us. And this is the first factual proof of, uh, of the expansion of the universe. Uh, by the way, in the audience of that AAS presentation was another young uh, astronomer named uh, Hubble. Um, so there you go. Uh, in 1930, the third search for Planet X uh, was successful at, at Lowell Observatory. Uh, there, Percival led the first one. We actually have plates that Percival might have seen that have Pluto on them, but uh, Percival's 50-year-old eyes probably couldn't quite make out the little dot moving quite as well as Clyde Tombaugh uh, here with his 20-year-old eyes. So, um, and um, other things that have been done throughout the years, 1960s, the lunar mapping for the and training for the Apollo missions happened in Flagstaff, and particularly lunar maps uh, that they used to land the spacecraft were actually drawn at uh, Lowell Observatory. The sole trusteeship is a unique form of governance. Uh, there is a single trustee, not a board. Um, and most of the work of the observatory has been done since Percival's death in 1916. The first trustee was Guy Lowell, a architect of some national note uh, and a cousin of Percival. Uh, he died in office. Uh, so far, he's the only trustee who's died in office, and I want to keep it that way. Um, he was succeeded by my grandfather, Roger Putnam, who was trustee for 40 years, quite a remarkable tenure. Uh, he was actually the guy who got to name Pluto. Uh, so uh, a little distinction to have in your life, I guess. Uh, he uh, retired in 1967 and was succeeded by his youngest son, Michael Putnam, who was trustee for 20 years um, and then uh, took over at the American Academy in Rome for several years. And so handed over the trusteeship to his older brother, uh, Bill Putnam, who was trustee for 26 years. And uh, then Bill retired in 2013 and uh, sort of tag, I was it. So now here I am. To get an idea of the kind of research that we do there, uh, Percival called for us to the study of astronomy with an emphasis on the solar system. But one of these things that becomes very clear very quickly is trying to understand context. You, you can't understand the sun if you don't understand it in context with other stars, um, how they come about, how they form, why they are different, etc. And uh, likewise, you can't understand our solar system unless you understand other solar systems and uh, other exoplanetary systems, understanding um, how they make up, what makes us different um, and what makes us the same. Uh, and by the same token, obviously, we all uh, sort of start with galaxies and star formation um, going back to the Big Bang. And so, uh, again, Everything needs to, we need to see where we are in the universe, how, how we fit in. Um, and so we have a, a wide variety of staff. Um, right now, uh, I believe 14 uh, tenured PhD astronomers. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh, postdoc uh, fellowships. Uh, we have some pre-docs um, and then 
um, uh, we are in partnership with a large number of other researchers around the world. Our facilities, <clears throat> ground-based facilities, are uh, basically at two sites. So this is a view looking uh, sort of north towards the San Francisco peaks. And Flagstaff is at the base of those peaks. That number one there is sort of where our main uh, academic campus is, what we call Mars Hill. And then out on Anderson Mesa here, we have a number of uh, telescope domes that we use. Um, the, the number two is the Perkins Dome and the 42-inch Hall Telescope. Uh, Perkins is now uh, owned and operated by Boston University. They're doing some long-term research with it. Uh, but we have moved it out there in the early 60s and used it for a number of years. It was our flagship telescope um, back then. Uh, we also participate in the National Undergraduate Research Organization, NURO, and so we have a, a telescope set aside for them. Um, and we have the number three, right now that dome is being repurposed. It did used to have a Schmidt telescope, but we're repurposing it to have a new one meter telescope in there, uh, courtesy of a, a very nice donor of ours. The facility to the lower right that you're seeing is the Naval Precision Optical Interferometer. It is an array of small telescopes and siderostats, um, and the light from different combinations of them can be brought together to within the same wavelength uh, to simulate uh, a larger telescope that would have the diameter of uh, the collective arms. So. In theory here, we can put together almost a thousand meter telescope if we're looking at a sufficiently bright object. Um, I've got a whole nother presentation about how an optical interferometer works, but that takes too long for this meeting. Our flagship uh, telescope, single aperture, excuse me, is the 4.3 meter Lowell Discovery Telescope. Originally, it was known as the Discovery Channel Telescope as they were major donor to building it, but um, everybody kept thinking that Discovery, Discovery owned its own telescope out in Arizona and Lowell was somewhere else. So uh, we collectively agreed with them, we rename it this way. So what you're looking at here, and I think there, uh, hopefully you guys can see my arrow, moving, my pointer moving across. That's the mirror uh, being held in there with these actuator motors. So. The mirror is just over 14 feet. Think of it as the world's uh, largest contact lens because it's only about four and a half inches thick. Uh, so it's actually flexes and it's held in place with these stepper motors, both around the edge and in concentric circles underneath. And they can uh, actively deform the mirror uh, to make it uh, maintain its perfect shape. So we have active optics on this telescope. We do not have adaptive optics on this telescope. Uh, hopefully we will be adding that in the next couple of years. Uniquely at the bottom of the telescope, you can't quite see in this picture, uh, we have what is known as the cube. So the telescope uh, focal point was designed so that we put a cube on it, into it slightly, uh, through one face of the cube. And we have the ability to hang, therefore, five different instruments off of the telescope. And by manipulating mirrors and sometimes filters, we can direct the light to any one of the five instruments very quickly. Uh, this allows us to shift, if there's a target of opportunity that shows up, um, to shift to the appropriate instrument and uh, observe very quickly. One of the instruments that we have on the telescope is express. Um, and to give you an idea uh, of, of its name, uh, Extreme Precision Spectrograph, this was built at Yale uh, by Deborah Fisher, who's actually now running the astronomy group for National Science Foundation. Um, and what she wanted to do was to be able to determine, uh, detect Earth sized planets um, around sun like stars. And how this works is it takes uh, advantage of the, um, the wobble that a planet causes a star to have. Uh, so the analogy would be uh, if you 
well, ever watched a track and field event and you've watched uh, hammer throwing, uh, even though the hammer is much smaller than the person pivoting around to throw it, nonetheless, if you notice, they don't stay in exactly a smooth cir circle, stand still. The hammer forces them to wobble a little bit, even though obviously they're wobbling the hammer a lot more. So if you know you're looking for sun-like stars, and they're well cataloged, and so we know where to find them, and you're looking for Earth-sized planets that are going to be in the habitable zone of those stars, you can determine what the wobble should be. And uh, so by, by calculating that, and then by eliminating all the noise that the star itself generates, um, you can determine whether or not there is indeed a planet, an Earth-like planet around a sun-like star. And um, this has been very, very successful. Um, it's generating a lot of really, really good information. And while we talk about wanting to filter out all that stellar noise, um, one person's noise is another person's data. So our we have astronomers who like to study sun-like stars. And so all that data about the star variability is actually very useful data for them in their research. Yeah. So it, it, it's a win-win situation for us. Um, other places that we do observing, um, not all on Earth, um, uh, a lot of a lot of Hubble research time uh, goes to Lowell Observatory astronomers. Uh, to the right of the Hubble, there you see a 747 mm -hmm. that NASA and the German Space Agency uh, uh, modified so that there's a door about two thirds of the way back on that airplane. They get up to about 45,000 feet. They open the door, and there's a two-meter telescope inside that's resting on a bunch of basically inner tubes so that it's vibrationally isolated from the aircraft. And um, they can do observing runs well above most of the moisture content of the Earth. And one of the instruments they use uh, is called HIPPO, and uh, that's that's something that was developed at Lowell Observatory. Um, we get a lot of time on the Keck. Uh, we also do a lot of time down in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, in Chile, uh, mostly. Um, and uh, one of our scientists now retired, but was uh, one of the principal scientists on the Kepler, Ted Dunham, uh, on the Kepler science team. So um, I want to talk a little bit about New Horizons. We were on the New Horizons mission, felt kind of weird that um, of all the organizations that participated in the New Horizons mission, we were the only one that existed when Pluto was discovered. Um, but uh, that's the way it is. And um, when um, the, our, one of our scientists was the science lead for the surface composition team, Will Grundy, at the beginning when it was launched, somebody was asking him, what do you expect to find? And he says, I expect to be surprised by what we find. And he was very much correct. Um, so everybody kind of thought that Pluto would be this, you know, dull icy rock that had been smacked by other smaller dull icy rocks. Um, but this mosaic here, the surface uh, mosaic, shows you that that's not really the case at all. There are some, uh, some asteroid impacts and a couple of them, you can see, and you would expect that. But if you notice, there's also mountains and, and, and terrain. And look here, over here at the right, there's all this smoothness where the surface is being turned over, as it were. So, so it turns out Pluto is geologically active um, and, and surprisingly so. Uh, and then the other quick image I'll show you here is this one. So this picture was um, a surprise in terms of people worked very hard to get it. Uh, that Sophia, I talked about that 747, uh, there was a known uh, occlusion. Pluto was going to occlude uh, a star. And they calculated where the occlusion shadow would be. And uh, folks at Lowell Observatory worked very hard to 
calculate the exact uh, center point of it, and they refiled the flight plan of Sofia the morning uh, at launch, and they got right down the center line. And so they got a long run at Pluto, and they were able to determine that there was indeed an atmosphere around Pluto. And so then the New Horizons team, two weeks later, when they were going by Pluto, in that two-week window, they reprogrammed the mission to be able to take this photograph. Because as you can see here, there actually are layers to Pluto. So this is Pluto. The spacecraft timed this so that the sun was on the far side. So Pluto was now eclipsing the sun. And so you get to see this silhouette and see some of the layers. You can see them over here on the left-hand side, about 10 o'clock. Um, and uh, so again, another area of fascination. Um, Pluto was, was not just a dull icy rock at all. Um, and what I want to do here is play you a small video uh, from uh, one of our scientists, uh, Deidre Hunter, uh, and then uh, hopefully you'll, the audio will come through and then uh, I'll keep going. On the Zoom settings, there's a button to click to play audio with video. David, is that on my side or is that on, on Lowell's side? Um, I believe it's on the presenter side. Uh, you can have a look yourself, but I think it's probably on, on Lowell's side, but I, I, I learned that button the hard way. I was going to look for it, but I can't uh, look under screen sharing. All right. Hopefully that has gotten us to. It should be under share screen All right, there. settings. My apologies. 
I think I've got this back again. Yeah, if I can get Deidre going again. So it's coming through now. No sound yet. There it is. Lol under screen share settings, there should be a button to play audio with video. Um, where do I find screen share settings? Uh, well, the, the, you should have a share, a, like a green share screen, maybe yes. it's at the bottom of your screen. I right, say so click on that. Share sound. Yeah. Let's see if that works for us. Yeah. Forming inside them. That sounds probably sounds better. What I would like to do is answer the big question for dwarf irregulars, which is how do they form clouds that form looking at a dense cold cloud? So then the stars form out of that, those kinds of, they're called molecular clouds. To understand more about how stars form in these cold molecular clouds, Deidre will head to the Discovery Channel Telescope, where she waits for the sun to go down to set up on a galaxy where she hopes to find some answers. The galaxies that I've chosen are a subset of a sample that's part of a project called Little Things. I'm using the camera to take images and the purpose of these images is to go very very deep so that we can study the outer disk of stars in these galaxies i observe in four four different through four different filters from the ultraviolet blue green and red and the purpose is that to see what kinds of stars are out there by, by looking in dwarf galaxies we're looking at an environment where 
star formation isn't explained by the current models, but if we look in the far outer disks of dwarf galaxies, we're looking at an even more extreme environment. And so if we can look out there, if we can see star formation going on out there, then we, we've, we've just we've poked a really big hole in the models. For Deidre to go deep enough to see star formation in the outer disks, she will spend two and a half nights to get the full spectrum of a single galaxy. The answers Deidre is looking for in these dwarf galaxies could also have implications in other questions about our universe. As for example, how it began. In the early universe, when the first stars formed, they formed out of a gas that was primarily hydrogen and helium atoms, and not any of uh, the heavier elements like carbon and um, nitrogen, oxygen that we um, see so much here on Earth. So that raises the question, well, how did those first stars form then without the benefit of those heavier elements. The gas around the first stars would have been pristine. Nothing like the gas we have now in the Milky Way. The closest thing we have to that kind of gas is what you find in dwarf irregular galaxies. If we can understand more about star formation in dwarf irregular galaxies, we might come that much closer to understanding the mystery of how the very first star in the universe was born. And you can see that there's, you can see why you have to expose a lot if you want to go really deep, because the galaxy is in here. But you can now, it's not something you discover because it's not just going to happen overnight. I've been working on it for over 30 years um, already, and so it's just something that you work at. You do one thing, and then you do another, and you think of something else, and you do this, and you do this, and you just try and put all these pieces together over time and hope that eventually you can make up a picture that actually um, makes sense. But there's this little tiny dwarf irregular galaxy, and um, what's you know it's, um, it has um, a little bit of star formation going on it, but not a whole lot. So all of it together is just it gives us a sense of our place in the universe. We went from this big bang where there was nothing but some atoms and dark matter to people sitting around eating with friends. I mean, what a journey that is. <laughs> and so, you know, while the dwarf irregular galaxies are only a piece of this whole thing, we're trying to put this big picture together to understand the universe that we're in and understand this journey that our universe is going on and the, which, which we are a part of. Okay, folks, I apologize for the uh, audio difficulties. Hope everybody got to uh, enjoy a little bit about Deidre's work. Um, another aspect of what we do at Lowell Observatory is very much engage with the public. Uh, Percival was a firm believer that to be a good scientist, a good researcher, uh, you should also be able to uh, talk about your research in a way that uh, would allow, as he said, uh, the, um, somebody from the general public to be a co-discoverer of that research, uh, to have that same joy of discovery of, of that something new. And so we've been running a program for a number of years there. Um, in 1994, it got large enough. We were having about 25,000 visitors a year uh, <clears throat> that we built a new facility. Uh, and we said, oh, if we make it able to handle 60,000 visitors a year, it'll just last us forever. Um, it's uh, currently expecting over 100,000 visitors this year. Um, and the people who study science centers and, and these kinds of things, 
tell us that with proper facilities, we should exceed 200,000. Uh, so uh, we're, we're working towards that. Um, uh, you mentioned at the beginning about uh, the kinds of telescopes we have here. This is the Giovanni Open Deck Observatory, which we opened um, in perfect timing six months before the pandemic hit. Uh, but uh, you can see here, this is uh, the, the best collection of uh, eyepiece viewing telescopes uh, that, that we have found in the world. Uh, so you have a, a, a 31 inch plane wave. Um, uh, we have a, something called a Moonraker telescope, which you can't quite see here, which is an homage to the Clark. Um, and, and one of the telescopes, we have a spectrograph hooked up to the others all just have eyepieces. And this is available for public viewing. Um, every clear night, um, we're open and people are, are welcome to come up and look through it and, uh, and see different objects through different kinds of telescopes. It's a, a very phenomenal facility. Uh, that has also helped increase our, our uh, public viewing, but uh, it's very much weather dependent, obviously. So we're also now looking to build a new visitor center. Um, and uh, this is a, a big project that's underway for us now. This is going to be a 42,000 square foot facility uh, with a lot more indoor uh, exhibits um, and, and a theater, et cetera, so that uh, we are not, uh, not just having people stay away when the weather's bad. Uh, to give you an idea of it from the outside, um, one of the things we are doing that's very unique is we're not building a planetarium inside the facility. We're going to use Flagstaff's very famous dark skies as a natural planetarium. And so you see up here at the, on top, um, a theater that is uh, above the treetops. And so has this expansive view across the entire night sky in Flagstaff, uh, which should make it be, uh, be pretty phenomenal uh, for people to look at. The theater um, also seating about 180, 200 people. Um, we wanted to have a unique uh, kind of uh, display screen, very immersive. Uh, and we looked uh, for different options with today's LED technology. Uh, the closest we could find at the time that it put together was this uh, display in Vegas. And it's about 12 feet tall. And uh, I think that one was around 35 feet um, uh, width. It's, a, it's obviously shaped in a curve. What we're building is something that's going to be 24 feet tall and about uh, 65, no, more than 65, uh, 100, it's going to be 165 degrees. Uh, so it'll practically wrap around you. Uh, so it should be uh, very, very immersive. And we hope will give us a tool to do a lot of uh, good storytelling there. Um, and just to get a sense of the size of this, um, I took this from the construction camera shot uh, earlier this week. Now, the workers that are building this are now calling it the Colosseum. Uh, behind this large black wall over here, that's the one side of the theater. Theater takes up about a quarter of the circle. And the rooftop is actually going to be, uh, rooftop is going to be above these uh, scaffolding markers here at the top. So you can see how it compares against the treetops. It's going to be pretty, pretty phenomenal. So um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and shift over. And as I promised, uh, get you guys some images. So uh, what I should do just to be fair is um, this, you can go and look at these yourselves. So if you go to lowell.edu uh, and then um, type in a search for LMI, that's Large Monolithic Imager, um, and gallery. So LMI space gallery, you'll get uh, to a link that will take you to this page. Um, as I said, this is a, the LMI is, at the time we bought it, it was the largest commercially available uh, CCD in the world. 
Uh, it's um, approximately 6,000 pixels on a side. Uh, so it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty, pretty phenomenal for what it can do. Obviously, most of the images I'm going to show you um, are shot with typically three different filters, color filters, to get you the color rendering. So you end up with something approximating um, 120 megapixel images, um, which are pretty good. Um, this one, the moon here, I'm going to have to shrink it down, I think, a little bit. I can. This is actually five different images that were stitched together because the field of view of the uh, is a little over one arc second, and we didn't. The telescope is too short for that, but you can see levels of detail. You know, if you look in here, how how close in uh, the level of detail you can get with this camera. It's 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 pretty. Pretty interesting. Um, and uh, I'm just going to pick a couple. Uh, following up on Deidre's talk. So, by the way, you look at the thumbnail, you get the description, but then you can do this. You double click on it again, it'll download this image uh, in full depth. What is fascinating about this globular cluster. Is 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 to the point where Deidre is talking about the early uh, universe. So, if you notice, this is basically yellow and white because it's mostly hydrogen, and some helium. It's about twelve billion years old, um, so it's very early in the history of the universe. Um, but it's actually not that far away. Um, it's uh, whatever, 10, well, 10 kiloparsecs, so as it says there. But it's pretty interesting that you can have um, something that's relatively close to us that is that old compared to um, our sun at a paltry, you know, 4.5 billion years of age. Um, and another quick one that I always like, we probably passed it. Here we are. <clears throat> is the Sombrero Galaxy. And the reason I am fascinated with the Sombrero Galaxy, or I like it, as it were, is um, this was the second galaxy that VM Slifer uh, did a, the, took a, a spectrum. So the first one he did was Andromeda. <coughs> Excuse me. And to give you an idea of what he went through, it would. It took Andromeda took him sixty five hours of exposure time onto a single slide, and this is before electricity. He would go out to the Clark Telescope, pull the slide out, put it in, line up on target, open the exposure, and then stay on the telescope, making sure it stayed on target for eight. 10 hours, as much as he could get, put it away in the dark, come back out the next night, and so on and so forth. So he built up enough photons on the emulsion to then go and get it. So in the case of the first slides, 65 hours of exposure time for Andromeda. Um, I think Sombrero was less, but still, you can imagine just to get one piece of data. The interesting thing is Andromeda is blue shifted. It's coming towards us. Eventually the Milky Way and Andromeda will run into each other. Um, not in our lifetime, so I'm not worried. But Sombrero, that doesn't, so Andromeda doesn't prove the universe is expanding. Andromeda proves that maybe the universe is all running in the same direction. I don't know what it proves. But Sombrero is radically red shifted. It's moving away big time and fast. And so all of a sudden you have the combination of the two is really where you have your proof that the universe is moving apart. And uh, that, that makes it, uh, in my mind, sort of an interesting thing to keep an eye on. Um, and then there are the usual sort of beautiful pictures there. So um, there's another ones that are just, uh, Stephen's Quintet is always, is always just very pretty. And, Anyway, there we go. Trouble is, when it downloads, it downloads so much that trying to get it to resolve and still fit on the page, 
Oh, well. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll end the presentation and I'll be happy to uh, take questions from everybody. Lowell, well, thank you very much. That was, that was a really nice presentation. And um, gosh, I, I, I had apologize for the audio difficulty. But. That's okay. Um, Mark, do you want to, do you want to start? Is, is Deidre a part of the Lowell Observatory staff? Yes, Deidre is one of our tenured astronomers. As she said, she's been working on this for uh, over 30 years, all at Lowell Observatory. Uh, we're very, uh, Percival had a very strong uh, belief that uh, that is part of the culture of the observatory, that you buy the best equipment you can and you give unfettered access uh, to uh to to your observers to your astronomers and so they have uh, full academic freedom to pursue their research um uh use of the facilities and uh and so long as they are doing good science they just keep doing good science and there's no publish or perish requirement there's no uh um uh, and no course curriculum we aren't a we are not a, a an educational institution we're a research institution so they can just do pure research for their entire careers and not only does that let them build up a body of knowledge that's phenomenal but this often their careers will overlap with others and allows us to build up uh substantial uh, uh, uh literally decades and generations of of knowledge around particular topic areas uh, that's that's proven uh, unique in the world. Very good. Yeah, hi Lowell, this is uh, Leo Dave Roy and uh, it's a pleasure meeting you. And the, the question I have is, um, you were talking about uh, uh, the wobble of, 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 a, of a star to determine um, the exoplanet. What is our, the, have we determined the wobble of our sun, how much it wobbles in, in relation to our planets? Um, yes, we have, as a matter of fact, and, and one of the things that uh, the express instrument does, it's a fiber head that's on the, uh, on the telescope leading down to a box that's vibrationally isolated on its own piece of foundation elsewhere in the building. Um, we have a very little telescope that we, we have set up that also fiber feeds to express during the daytime, and it looks at the sun. So it's been collecting data about the sun's, uh, you know, radial velocity and and the, and the amount of <clears throat> impact that, that we are having on it. Uh, so we actually are building up an even better database on the sun than we had before. To give you an idea of what sort of radial velocity um, we're talking about, the um, the impact uh, the Express can measure down to um, about 10 to 12 centimeter per second radio velocity differences. So that is um, slower than you and I walking down the sidewalk. Um, that's the level of, of extreme precision that that instrument is capable of getting to. Well, thank you. Lowell, I will just, I like the video, but I guess as far as the presentation is concerned, all I can say is, wow, I never realized uh, that Lowell Observatory did so much. Um, I'm very much impressed with what's going on there. Well, please, please feel free to come on out and visit. Uh, now that everybody can travel again, it's, it's a very interesting, unique place. And I mean, one of the things that everybody, a lot of people don't think about is that Percival Lowell was not a professional astronomer. He was an amateur. Um, uh, he was a, what's so called a grand amateur because um, he could afford to be. But um, he he did his he he did his own research. He he took his own plates. Did all that did all that stuff himself. So I have a question. Impressive. What are, what are the uh, responsibilities of a trustee? Um, there was a, a guy at Yale 
uh, who talked about the duty of a trustee is to preserve for the future against the demands of the present. And, and that's basically, whether it's a board or a single individual, is uh, how do you balance out what makes the institution su be successful against its mission now and is sustainable so that it will still be uh, in existence and doing good work in 20, 30, 50, 100 years from now. Um, so it's, it's that tension, for lack of a better word, is, is uh, the tightrope that the, the trustee is supposed to walk. Lowell, do you have an example of, of a decision you would make long-term, short-term? Um, well, certainly I can give you an example of a decision my father made um, as trustee. Uh, no single institution um, before or since had ever committed to and then succeeded in building a four meter class telescope. Uh, four meter and six and eight meter telescopes are, are massive. Uh, Murphy's Law shows up in spades. Uh, they are lengthy. Um, we actually got it done in a relatively short period of 10 years. Um, but most, uh, so most people form consortia or there's government uh, standing behind it. Uh, for, for Lowell Observatory to go out there and have the audacity to say that we're going to build our own four meter telescope. Um, that, that was a big, uh, what was that expression from some book a few years ago? A, a big, hairy, audacious goal, a BHAG. Um, uh, it was absolutely a bet the farm uh, commitment for the institution. Um, and that's something that I don't think a board of trustees would do, uh, but a, a single individual um, uh, absolutely might. And my father did. Um, and it was transformative to the institution uh, in ways we had no idea. Uh, and and we are still finding our way through some of them. Very good. Now, where does your uh, funding come from? Is it uh, do you get federal grants, private donations? How does that work, or do you have a some sort of uh, endowment? Well, we do have an endowment. The trust uh, as, as is is an endowment, but most of our funding uh, is uh, NASA and NSF funding in terms of research funding. Um, we also get a fair amount of money from our public program. Uh, we charge admission, that sort of thing. Uh, we have a very uh, good and growing donor uh, support group uh, that, is, that has helped us a lot. Um, what the trust does is the trust, um, well, the trust does a couple things. One is the trust became the collateral to allow us to do the loans to build, the, take out the loans to build the, uh, the telescope. It was a $52 million, $53 million telescope. Um, at a time we committed to it, our operating budget at the time we committed to it was, uh, I think, $5 million a year. Uh, so taking on that project, as I said, was, was fairly substantial on our part. Um, and the trust let us uh, basically find our way through the actual construction and getting it live. Um, the trust also does things like uh, supports astronomers when NSF funding cycles tend to be, um, uh, I'm not going to say yo-yos, but uh, uh, sine waves, shall we say. And they, um, so what happens is, is that sometimes your area of research is, is really hot. And so you get all the funding, you can't get out of the way of the funding. And then all of a sudden something else will become hot. And now you don't have the funding. Uh, and so... Uh, we, we make sure that it, if they're doing, if the research is good, people just keep getting the money. They don't, so they, they can keep going and keep pursuing it and make, and have continuity. I remember going out there when I was maybe 17 or 18 years old, and they were talking about this, uh, this, uh, solar study project that they were starting up and the partnership was with, um, the high altitude observatory in, in Colorado. And then I remember being out there five or six years later and, well, the folks at the, at, at the high altitude, they couldn't keep going, whatever changes, et cetera. 
So they were now at a new partner, the folks over at, at Georgia Tech. And that went on for about five or another five or 10 years. And then the Georgia Tech people went away. And, but we kept doing it. And so, you know, that one project and that project has had a successor project. Um, our current director is now finishing it off and about ready to hand off to somebody junior on the staff. So we have now 50, almost 60 years of solar study research that's just unmatched in the world in terms of just base knowledge. That kind of makes me think of uh, an archaeologist uh, that uh, doesn't want to disturb so much um, of the facts and evidence and such to save it for future uh, reference and in, uh, in research. Uh, do you do the same thing in yours? Uh, excuse me for a minute. I have a small dog that I think is eating something bad. Sounds like mine. All right. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm just a little confused. Are you asking in terms of what we do in terms of archives of our, of our records and plates or what? No, I was thinking more uh, an archaeologist uh, just will only disturb so much of a site to save it for future re uh, research. They might have more uh, research. How does that relate to astronomy in your research? Um, it, it's, it's different. Um, what happens is, is that um, you, 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 if you're an astronomer and you're doing, you've got a particular area of research, you gather your data um, for what you're looking for. But somebody may come along later and want to look at it for a different reason. Um, so uh, two, two things, uh, two examples of this. One is um, looking for the same thing, the folks doing the New Horizons mission. I mean, if you think about it, we have only known Pluto for about one third of a Plutonian year. We have not known Pluto even for one orbit of Pluto around the sun. And so, um, when they were launching New Horizons, they wanted to refine the orbit of Pluto as best they could in order to make sure the spacecraft could be as accurately targeted for the, when it did its approach and, and, and fly, flyby. Yeah. And then they realized, wait a minute, there are plates at Lowell Observatory. Why don't we go back? And so they went back to the 1930 plates, which are the known ones, but then they knew where Pluto was, so they went back and looked at the 1921 plates. And they found Pluto, they got another 10 years of, of orbital accuracy on Pluto because they now knew where to look for it and found the dot and so on. They tried the 1915 plates, which are the ones that Percival Lowell might have actually looked at and seen that Pluto was on, but uh, the emulsion was too old uh, at that point in time and then and, and sort of gone away. So, but that, that did get them get another 10 year baseline on Pluto's orbit. And the accuracy is phenomenal. They, they flew that spacecraft so accurately, they got their, their gravity assist around Jupiter. They left Jupiter orbit doing about 55,000 miles an hour. The only course correction they did from there to when they did the flyby was an adjustment six months after Jupiter of 10 miles an hour. That's it. That, and they went right literally halfway between, they flew between Pluto and Sharon. So um, kudos to that team, but that's an example of it. The other thing is, is that we've done at the observatory a number of um, uh, sky surveys. And we have those plates in our archives. And uh, we are finding more and more that people are going back to those plates because they have uh, object positions that they're now interested in and they get to see any changes that have occurred from when the plates were taken. Obviously a more primitive technology than today, but still something that also gives you a, a look back of you know, 50 or 100 years. 
uh, and and that's that's that that proves to be very useful. I I think I think this is a a good point to end. Um, Lowell, this there's some fascinating stories, and and I want to thank you very much. No, could I sneak today. one more question in? Oh, go ahead, Paul. Okay, kind of following up on the archaeology thing. One thing that has been going on around here is Harvard Observatory has an incredible uh, collection of plates that they've accumulated over the years. They've run out of room to store them, mm -hmm. and they've been in, embarking on a project to digitize their entire collection. Are you guys up to anything like that? Um, we actually have started to do the same thing. We are one of the two planetary archive centers in the world. Uh, we have a, a rich collection of plates. Um, hold on a second. I'm being yelled at. Go. And um, so we have also started on the, the we've got a, a NASA grant that we're working on to go through doing this. The One of the issues you face is you need to do multiple resolution scans um, so that you have some that are good enough to, so to speak, thumbnails that are good enough to let you identify the thing you really need to look at. Then you need the full level scan uh, to get you the rest of the way there. So it's a, it's a long and tedious task with some specialized equipment. Um, obviously things like the, the Pluto plates have their own historic value. So we gotta be very, very careful in terms of what we mess around with there. Very good. And I think on that note, Lowell, thank you very much. This is a very engaging, very ex excellent presentation. And I uh, enjoyed this a lot. All right, my, my pleasure. And uh, do me a favor if you get a chance to send me the link to the YouTube, whatever. Uh, so I'll, I'll pass that around. And uh, I hope you guys have a great meeting. And thank you guys very much for putting up with me. Take <laughs> care. Lowell. Great job. Round of applause. Very, very good.